There's a lot of them. <laughs> um, I was as I was thinking, I was just thinking about um, Lord of the Rings. I think one of the greatest characters around is Gollum. Gollum is a side character. Um, in the, those things, you have Frodo, in the, uh, Bilbo in, in the, the Hobbit, and but then you have uh, Frodo in Lord of the Rings. But they have uh, Gollum showing up. Without Gollum, you have a, a character who struggles, who gives up a lot, who's not really heroic, but overcomes everything. That's uh, Frodo and Bilbo before him. And they have to go up against these terrible ones. Gollum is the spice that makes it really, really, really interesting. Take him out. I think a lot of the – it's just not as fun anymore. He's so fun to have him around. And there's other ones like that as well. But the idea is you need to have both the meat of it, the one who is the heart of it, and you need to have an adversary who's worthy of him. And then you need to have the spice sometimes, which is, could be the main characters or it could be side characters. Uh, if you just use an old example, if you ever watched the old TV show Happy Days, Ron Howard starred as um, Richie Cunningham. He was the heart of it, but Fonzie was the spice. And there are a lot of ones like that. Uh, Captain Kirk was the, uh, could have been considered the heart of Star Trek along with McCoy, but Spock was the spice. So mm. you have a lot of ones like that. Okay, so um, I'm stuck on Cersei Lannister or Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones, cliche, yes. But, or even uh, Daenerys Targaryen, I think one thing that R.R. Martin got right is that in every way, each of the characters were villains in their own rights, even Daenerys Targaryen, because she's a conqueror. And as Africans, we, we, uh, as Africans, we know that conqueror, conquering is not really a bad thing, it's just another word for. As another colloquialism for colonialism. So, you know, as Africans, we know that when you're reading Game of Thrones, you see the good, or not Africa, as human beings, you see the good and the bad side of all the characters. And so you realize that if you're living in Westeros, then every Targaryen will always be a villain. And if you're living in Essos or Sotheros, you can see Cersei as a villain. So I think a character that definitely stands out to me that it's a very, very good character, very in depth, well built, is Cersei Lannister. But then again, it wouldn't really work for a short story because. R. Martin had a long time to build his characters. So, but yeah, Cersei Lannister is a good character to watch out for. I think some of my favorites are in the Expanse series. Um, I, I think my favorites there are, are Christian Avasarla and Amos Burton. Uh, Avasarla knows who she is. She's strong and commanding, unapologetic about it, but she's also vulnerable. We, we see some softness in her relationship with her husband. But we also see a lot of the no-nonsense attitude in her professional life. The, I think the cursing and the, the harsh dialogue that she has sets up an initial shock and disconnect with what you think her character should be like. But it quickly kind of enamors you to her and strengthens her. As she's got such presence and gravitas that she commands every scene she's in. I think Amos is, is another similar study in strength and vulnerability. He's, he's another one who knows exactly who he is, but also knows what his limitations are. He's, he's had a rough background, and I think it's really cool that he accepts that he's not a good person by nature, but he's, so he surrounds himself with good people that will keep him on a righteous path. He's, he's very self-understanding that way. He, he wants to be good, but he knows his demons. Um, I, I think he, he's capable, confident, acceptable of the dialogue. He, he's got great one-liners, and so the audience embraces that toughness. I think, I think one other interesting example would be Bob Johansson from the Bob Bar series by Dennis E. Taylor. This one might be a little, a little more of a stretch because Bob's a replicant, and as he copies himself, each new iteration takes on a slightly different personality. He's always got snark, ingenuity, he's got a strong moral compass, you can relate to him, but each version of himself drifts that a little bit in different directions, eventually evolving stark differences that create conflict within and among essentially himself, and I find that very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, recently finished a book by an Australian author called um, uh, Rowan Wilson, I believe, and that book was called The Roving Party, um, and it's based on actual history. Uh, one of the states in Australia is a state called Tasmania. It's the little island that's uh, off the south of Australia. Uh, and oh, this, this was probably the case in all states, but uh, definitely in Tasmania, back in the 1800s, uh, you know, there was a royal commission for the 
uh, you know, the white colonists to hunt down the indigenous Australians in that area. Um, <clears throat> and so this story follows that and follows... Uh, it's, it's a fictionalization of an actual roving party from those days. Uh, but one of the most fascinating characters to me in that was the second in command in this hunting party because he was an indigenous Australian himself. Uh, which you pretty, which you really needed back then, because Indigenous Australians were such masters of the land, such great hunters and trackers, um, and you know they really understood the land. And as as like a colonist um, back then, say a British colonist or you know a first generation white Australian in those days, you didn't have that understanding of the land. Um, and this character's name was Black Bill, um, and I think they never really dove into his motivations, uh, which made him more than more fascinating, but. Uh, I found this figure who had been driven to turn against his own people in such a fundamental way really fascinating. Um, and because a lot of it was told from his perspective and a few really relatable tragedies befell him over the course of the book, you really, you really related to him, even though he was doing these really atrocious things uh, along with the other members of this roving party. Uh, so I really like that. I do find I like... Um, characters who have superficial contradictions but if you kind of scratch the surface you can really understand where they're coming from um, and by the end of that book I think uh, you really you really did get a sense of where Black Bill was coming from whether you agree with him or not and so I just thought he was such a wonderfully rendered character um, and al also that book is just brilliantly written too I think so I highly recommend that one The Roving Party by Rowan Wilson So the one that I thought of um, that, I've, that I've sort of recently encountered is the character of John LaRoche from the film Adaptation. He's played by Chris Cooper. Um, and he's basically depicted as this sort of scruffy, down-on-his-luck guy who's, who's missing some of his front teeth, um, whose goal in life is to collect and breed these very rare ghost orchids. Um, and the reason I find him an interesting character is that, that he could have been drawn as sort of this very cliche, hippie or, or redneck type rural kind of guy um, and sort of come with the baggage of everything we've seen in movies before of those kinds of characters. But he's actually depicted with this amazing interior beauty. He's got absolute scientific passion for the, for the plant that he's after, but he's got these amazing views on love and life and how the world works that then becomes sort of the envy of characters in the sh in the movie that would otherwise consider themselves to be higher class than him. Um, and so he's one of these characters, though, that I think what the movie does really well is that everything we know about John LaRoche is, is taken from the filter of two other characters. So you learn about him through other people's perceptions. He is initially... Um, the subject of journalism, so the subject of um, an interview, series of interviews by a journalist called Susan. And she initially kind of mocks him a little bit. She's, she sees, she's a New York type who's, who sees herself as higher class than him. Um, but as she starts to sort of really get invested in his passion for the hunt for this plan, she starts to realise that actually the thing he has, this ability to get up and be enthusiastic every morning for this amazing this amazing creation of nature is actually something she's lacking in her own life. So you start, and she actually starts to fall in love with that. So you see this changing of this character based purely on her perceptions of him and how she's writing about him. And then on top of that, both Susan and John are being written about by the playwright um, Charlie Kaufman, who's also put himself in the movie. So you've also got this extra element of not knowing at any point what bits of the character of John LaRoche are actually true um, and which bits are actually all done through the filter of, of two other people writing about him. And I think that's something I haven't seen done much in, in fiction or certainly that was one one that I encountered that and found that very powerful way of showing character as, as how other people put them together. Um, and the other thing I found interesting about him is he's a character who gets, who wants to learn about things to this incredible degree. Um, and then once he's learned everything about a topic, he then can let it go. And I think so often we um, define characters by the idea of obsessions and goals and hanging on to things. 
But we don't actually look at characters much through their ability to let go. And, and he is the character that can absolutely do that. And then you can then extrapolate and say, well, how would he be in a relationship? How is he in other aspects of his life? Does he just let go in the same way? Yes. Uh, one of my favourite characters ever, and the character who I think probably most exemplifies this honest, this brutal, terrible honesty, is um, Granny Weatherwax from Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. Granny is this cruel, spiteful, petty woman, and she knows it. And because she's so aware of the kind of person that she is, she really fights hard to not act cruelly or with spite or to be petty to other people even though she wants to be um, so I think that's really entertaining the the conflict between the kind of person that she is and the kind of person that she is determined to act like I think that's fascinating it, it's really really entertaining to read because she's so funny and she's so awful <laughs> and she's and she's a good good person because she realises um what she is and actively tries to counter it. <laughs>